Hello, Steve Stack, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. Uh, today we're visiting one of our customers' homes and we're going to demonstrate and take you through the steps of installing one of Baird's custom-made mantles that you can order online and follow these steps and install it in your own home. What we're going to do is just do a quick measurement here today so you will know what you need when you visit BairdBrothers.com to order that mantle online. One of the first things you're going to want to do once you receive your mantle is unpack the mantle and remove the cellophane wrapping. Upon unwrapping the mantle, you're going to find the mounting strip that we would supply with the mantle shipped to your house. Remove that and finish unpacking the mantle. Once you have your mantle unpacked, we're going to determine the actual final height of the mantle and your side to side location. Now we're going to run a level line across the top of the mounting board location so we know that mantle piece once installed is going to lay nice and straight and level. In this installation we're working with a conventional stud wall above a masonry front. So at this point you're going to want to identify the location of your studs behind the drywall. Now you'll be able to lay out the rest of the wall and transfer those dimensions to your 2x4 mounting plate. Once you've determined your stud location and you've transferred those dimensions to your mounting 2x4, you're going to attach the 2x4 mounting plate to the wall. Now that the 2x4 nailer is in place and ready to receive the mantle, you're going to prepare the mantle by drilling some pilot holes to accept screws that will in turn attach the mantle to the 2x4 nailer. As you can see, we've completed our mantle project. Uh, this project today took approximately 30 minutes start to finish. Visit us at BairdBrothers.com, go to our mantle section, and start the process. We'll gladly send you a mantle to your home, ordered easily, delivered conveniently, and ready for installation. What's up guys, I'm Christy with Oak Hill Millworks and today we are going to show you some behind the scenes for how to do your own DIY shiplap wall. Sometimes before you get started building up a project, you actually have to tear down. So where we're at right now with the project, we've already removed all the trim that was underneath the stairwell and the baseboard, as well as the legs and the pediment that were above the door. Now we're at the point in the project where we need to locate our studs. We're going to use this stud finder to move it against the wall, locate our studs so that when it's time to put the shiplap boards up, we can nail straight through the face of the board and get a nice secure fasten to our wall. Here's how this works. You're going to push the button on the side, let it calibrate, and then you just slowly start to slide it on your wall. You're going to see this arrow form. When you get the beep, you would mark it, and then you would continue in the same direction until it starts to disappear. Move it back, and when you get that next arrow, that's the other side of your stud. So you would mark that side as well, and then find your center point. That's the center of your stud. All right, so once you have all your studs marked with just small marks, and we've already laid this out, but you would grab a four foot roll to just get a straight edge and mark your studs the whole way up. This will make it a lot easier on you later on. After your studs are laid out, you wanna take your measuring tape and the best way to start with a shiplap wall is from the bottom and work your way up. So go all the way to the edge, all the way to where the legs on your door are going to be. If you don't have legs, just bump it all the way up to your door jamb. So for us, ours are around 103 inches. So I'm gonna make that cut and get started. 
All right, so we got our first piece already cut down. Right now we're just gonna do a test fit and make sure we are in the right place. For this particular project, we are choosing to build out our door jam. So now that I have the right length, I have a good reference point for where this door jam will get nailed up. So the reason we're building the door jam out is because we have a three quarter inch depth on this shiplap. If we weren't to build the, sh the door jam extension out, we would lose the detail and the depth that comes with the door trim. All right, so in this project, we also bumped out our electrical box because we don't want to lose the depth on that either. Make sure you turn off the power while adjusting your electrical box. Don't ask me how I know. All right, so some people just choose to nail their boards to the studs. We're gonna also put some liquid nails on it, just a simple line, nothing major. That's gonna give it the extra insurance it needs. It doesn't need much. This first board in place. Always a good idea to continue to check for level running horizontally with your boards throughout your project. For this one, I'm gonna make sure I do two nails, one more towards the top and one more towards the bottom just to get a more even nailing in the stud. Hey, who, uh, who moved that? Who moved the uh, air blower gauge? Was that uh, one of my friends? <laughs> this job is a lot easier when you have a helping set of hands. This is Steve from Baird Brothers. He is my helper today. Say hello, Steve. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Looks like you're making progress, Chris. Coming along. I think originally I thought I was just gonna use a contour gauge and butt this stuff up against my door trim. And then after realizing I would lose the depth of my door trim and the detail there, prying all the trim off was actually, it wasn't difficult, but it was uh, time consuming. Definitely doable. Okay, so here's where we're at in the process. We've built out our door jam extensions, and we've got a couple boards up so far. This is the pre-primed poplar from Baird Brothers. This stuff goes up really nicely, and if you scratch it up a little bit, it's all right, because you still are gonna paint it afterwards. We also brought out our outlet, three-quarter inch, so that it would be nice and flush with the front of the shiplap wall. We are going to keep putting boards up on the wall. Eventually, we'll get to a point where we can start laying down our trim. This is the fun part. It's like putting a big puzzle together. All right guys, so for this piece, we are going to test fit it first because we wanna make sure it fits around this door jam extension before we go gluing and nailing. We use the jigsaw to cut around and it looks really good. So we're gonna go ahead and glue and nail.
Okay, last piece is tricky. The ceiling isn't totally level, which is pretty typical in an old house. So we cut a little tapered piece on the bandsaw. <laughs> With a smiley. Oops, that's all right. If you have that, if you have a little blowout there at the top, trim's gonna cover that, no big deal. Watch the rings. Okay, so we have our entire shiplap wall installed and now it's time to start working on the trim pieces. So here's where we're at. We've done some lattice pieces towards the top to frame out our shiplap wall. And then we did one down the side as well. What we're finding is, and this is part of doing it yourself at home, you're going to run into issues that you kind of have to troubleshoot as you go. What we're finding is this overhang is not the same the whole way down. It's not a big deal. We're just gonna use caulking to make a nice seam the whole way up. Making sure it's not going anywhere. All right guys, well that wraps up our DIY shiplap wall. As you can see, it's looking incredible. This is easily a weekend project. Before today, I spent time taking all the trim off. And as you can see, the trim around our door looks fantastic. We chose not to use a contour gauge. We chose to bump everything out that three quarter inch. And we kept checking for level as we went throughout our project. So you can see all of our lines look really nice and straight across. Huge improvement already for this wall in our home. Next up, as you can see, we have all of our nail holes. We're gonna get some wood filler, fill those in. It's already primed. We'll just do some painting. We have some trim to paint. We're gonna have a nice shiplap wall in our home that we did ourselves with help from our friends at Bear Brothers. Good morning, Christy. Good morning. How are we doing? We're doing well, thank you. Just finishing up our cuts for the day. Good, good, good. Welcome everybody. Uh, Steve Stack, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, Canfield, Ohio. We've got a neat project and, and we're starting to take advantage of a soon to be revealed uh, workshop slash studio where we're gonna be doing some projects like what we're gonna do today. We've recruited Christy from Oak Hill Millworks. Yeah. Hi guys, thanks for having uh, me. Came across this morning to give us a hand. She's she's the knowledge and I'm just here to oversee. So yeah. we're gonna have fun. Let's so do it. Uh, what we're what we're gonna take you through today is great spring project. It's a western red cedar potting bench, a garden potting bench. I have one at home. Uh, we use it especially coming into the planting season with the gardens and the flower pots and all this and that. And it's a nice little yard ornament, really. It's something you, you put out, leave out. Hopefully today we're gonna give folks some instructions. There's a couple different options how you can assemble this set. What's that, what's that new tool that we're gonna introduce today? Baird has available the brand new 720 Pro pocket hole jig from Craig, and you will be seeing us use that today. That was like somebody gave you uh, a 
gift certificate for dinner when you saw this thing. I'm so, so excited, excited to about. use it. Well, it's a really smart system. It knows what depth you need to drill just by getting going on it. We'll show you. And if you don't have it, we have another way to show you. You can get this kit going. So, yep. should we get going on the project? What do you think? Let's start getting some material up and, and see what we can do to get this thing put together. Sounds good. So this is our basic framework for the top and bottom shelf. So we can go ahead and start laying it out. If you have a workbench, great. If not, just spread it out on the floor of your workspace. With the Naughty uh, Inland Cedar, you'll have a milled face and then you have the natural rough face right off of the mill. Yeah. So because it is kind of a rustic project, I kind of kept it in my mind to keep the rustic side turned out, yeah. the appearance side. So when we get around to putting a, a protective coating on this, whatever, whatever our choice or the homeowner's choice might be, it, it really intensifies and, and brings that rough, that rough cedar to life. I agree, that's what I would do. We're gonna show a couple different options as far as assembly goes. How, how do you wanna proceed with this one? There's a lot of ways to go about it. If it were me at home, I would just go basic and I would do a little bit of glue where all the uh, where all the ends of the wood meet and then you can either drive screws through the ends here and here if you have a screw gun or if you have a brad nailer that's another really good option you can do pocket holes but i don't think that's totally necessary for this type of a build so i say we just brad nail it okay so going back to a point that you made we're using another product that we offer here at baird brothers we have the whole family of type on products this is their ultimate wood glue, waterproof for yeah. interior, exterior use, and it, and it strengthens the whole assembly process. That stuff is extremely strong. So the green one, Type On 3, is the one that's rated for water. So you're gonna wanna use TB3. You can look up uh, brake tests online. It will never break on the glue joint. The, the wood will actually snap before the glue seam does. And you try and be neat when you're working with the wood glue, but guess what? If you're gonna be a woodworker or a carpenter, that's what the blue jeans are for. If this were me working by myself at home, I'd try to clamp this whole thing because then I, that's like my second pair of hands. Two's good. Sometimes you hear, you hear guys talking about what's, what's their most valuable tool in the shop. This is one of them. I love the combination square. Combination tri-square. We can adjust that and we can just work that piece nice and plumb and square for just that real nice appearance. We're taking the time to build this morning right. and we want, we want it to turn out nice and we want it to look like we cared. We do care. Let's make it square because we care. Sometimes the cedar boards, and it's very common and it's, and it's acceptable in the grade of the cedar, you get this, this runoff or this wane. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we're gonna turn that down. Same thing over here. Yep. I could see this actually doubling as a grill cart. Could hang up all your spatulas and accessories. Okay, just stand her up. Okay, so like I say, uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, reinforce that with these, these Craig exterior screws. So along with that Baird Brothers workbench top, uh, and we've introduced you to that new Craig 720 this morning, Craig also makes a great framework for these carts to attach one of our workbenches to. And you can see how easy that was. You can roll it around anywhere in your shop and still have that great work surface. So Craig's a great partner of ours. And uh, I know you use some of their product at, at your shop, Christy. I do. And again, this Western Red Cedar 
It's not an inland cedar. It has great porosity, so that allows this glue to really do a job on it. Yeah, that's not going anywhere. All right, see how we did. Let's swing around. How about that? Not bad, that's gonna be a nice size. We need some shelves. All right, so we just got our boards cut to length for the bottom shelf. Go ahead and test fit them first to make sure we're on the right track. We have okay, Chrissy, how do you wanna do that? You wanna go to the five and a half, four and a half? Yeah, it's nice to break them up for aesthetics. So we have a one by six, one by five, another one by six, and a one by four in the back. All right, so a lesson I learned the hard way. Never cut to your final length right away. Get close and then clean it up later. That way you don't have to go buy more wood. Okay, so that that makes a nice wide work surface, Christy. And uh, on the bottom, I went ahead and did a little separation to give a great effect. That's nice. So yeah, some of the soil and debris can you know, wash itself down through there. And then to this, we're gonna take, I, I think it might, might look nice. I know we have a, a one by four element coming up this back yeah. for a couple other things that the plan calls for. And that'll allow us to put a nice little apron out here on the end caps, kind of like lock it. everything together. What do you think? That looks great. Okay, let's start getting some of, uh, some of these shelf caps uh, nailed down. What we'll need to do is transfer the lines we made on the top just around the side here. Okay. Or you can eyeball it, you know, by this. Nice. And then we can lock that bad boy on there and we can do some of the Craig fastening. That's pretty sweet. All right, yeah, the pocket hole, the pocket hole is really sweet and it, it'll just give this some additional strength. So this isn't a bad little project. This would be a, a nice one day project at home uh, with minimal tools. Yeah, especially if you get a fully cut kit. Stitch it. So with that wider one by six, Christy, I see you're, you're going three nails rather than the two on some of the four and a half and three and a half inch boards. That's smart. That'll, uh, that'll really pull that board down to the uh, framework. And if we take a quick peek, you did good. None of them came out the front of the fascia board. You can't handle it. But look at that nice work surface. It's really pretty. I mean, that's going to be plenty deep. You know, set a flat of flowers on. Your pot's over there, you're mixing soil, yeah. have at it. You know, start to, start to do some of those beautiful baskets for the upcoming spring and summer. We did have a little bit of glue squeeze out here. It's no big deal. You can either use your finger or a wet rag and it'll take care of it. Now we can you want to do, the top cap? do our cap okay. and our lattice and we're getting close to the end. Now there is an option on this if you wanted to put in collapsible plant hangers. You can go a lot of different directions with this. Okay, right. let's keep going.
Okay, so as we wrap up this build, we are putting on some dental molding, aptly named because once it will be all spaced out, it kind of looks like teeth. We'll do our end moldings first so that we can find our center and place the remaining pieces. Good? Okay, Chris, so while I cut some pieces for the lattice work, you wanna see and yep. uh, come up with some, some type of spacing and we'll finish those, those dental blocks up and- Sounds good. We're headed down the home stretch. Okay, Christy, so we're doing the same thing on this lattice. We'll, we'll get ourselves a little gauge block and we'll see if we're right. We'll pop this back out. We've got our locator pencil marks. Dab of glue, dab of glue, double pin, double pin. Okay? Okay. And then we'll set that next one. Did a quick swap out to only inch and a quarter brad nails because we're working with two pieces of three quarter inch material. Inch and a half is obviously the same thing as two three quarter inch pieces of material and we don't want it to go through. Last piece. There it is. Should I label it? <laughs> it's been fun. Thanks for having me. Hey, no problem. And we enjoy having all you folks. We did some revisions along the way and that's okay, make it your own. You got a lot of surface space to mount stuff. Start some plants, some, some climbers in here and, and you know, by the time you're done planning, now you have a piece of yard art. The lumber package that we're putting together for this, you'll be able to accomplish this look along with the blueprints. Like and follow, shoot us your projects. Show us some of the stuff you've been doing with, with uh, our lumber and so forth. And uh, you know what? It's gonna be a fun sum. It's gonna be a fun one. If you do this project, make sure you tag Baird Brothers so they can see your progress. everybody, Steve Stack, Director of Business Development here at Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, Canfield, Ohio. We find ourselves back in our uh, studio workshop today and we're going to take you through a little project. We're going to create this uh, outline drawing here of some, some of our molding products. We've got some uh, Philly fans, some crown molding, some beadboard, and we're going to take that and eventually it'll wind up on one of our ceilings here in the studio. But before we do that, we got to do a little prep work. And today we have our material laid out and I got a great helper. I'm gonna introduce you to a third generation Baird. Come on over, I'll show you. Dylan, hello. Hi. How you doing today, babe? Good. Good. Hey everybody, this is Dylan Burdett, uh, Lori Baird's youngest son. Today we're using cherry. It's gonna be one of our feature ceilings uh, down the road. So you're gonna to wanna to stay tuned and keep watching. We're gonna do a little sanding today, Dylan just some details. And then once we get sanded and we tack cloth everything off, then we're gonna put a nice uh, modified oil base urethane coat on top of it. So let's go ahead and get started and we'll, we'll take the folks through the steps and explain to them why we're doing it, okay? Sounds good. All right, let's get ready. Okay guys, so as we can see, this uh, cherry Philly fence material, it's a five eighths by five inch face. 
beautiful cherry lumber. Uh, it's gone through our mill house. They run this through the molder and we want to accomplish somewhere between a 16 to 20 knife mark per inch. And the reason that is important, that's what accomplishes that beautiful smooth finish. To go one step beyond, we're gonna go ahead and sand. Why do you sand? You wanna minimize the knife marks. And as you can see, just in handling the boards, the bare wood will absorb oil from, from our hands. Okay, so we wanna get rid of any smudge marks, things like that. And in handling again, we're sliding the boards around. Okay, and that'll put a little scuff mark on it. And it closes the grain, so it'll accept stain differently or varnish differently than once it is a nice, clean sanding. A lot of different ways to sand. Hand sand, uh, scratch pads, sandpaper, and there's a ton of very affordable orbital electric sanders, battery pack sanders, uh, four by four palm sanders, they all work. You just have to get a feel for them. So we're gonna be using probably all of those today, just in demonstrating to you uh, a very simple prep that, that we're gonna do in the sanding process, but it makes your end product come out that much more pristine. All right, so Dill, let me jump back here and I wanna get you started on this sander. And it's very easy. With the Orbital, it does all the work and you allow it to do the work. So that's gonna be our first step, Dill, all right? And then, because this is a beaded tongue and groove product, we've got some little nooks and crannies in the profile. Same thing, and as simple as taking, we're working right now on our first sanding with 180 grit paper. Uh, fold it, the sponges work good, it helps conform to the profile, but that allows you to get down into that groove and just clean that up just a little bit. And now when we go to our next step after tack cloth and we put our varnish on there, it's gonna absorb it just like the face of the board where we use the orbital. All right, so why don't you, Dill, go ahead and finish the end of this board. Hey, I think you got it, Dill. And as we can see, see how fine that powder is? Yeah. Okay, we're doing a very light finished sanding and that's what, that's what you produce is that it's almost like facial powder quality mm -hmm. sawdust, right? You know, loosen that stuff up a little bit and, and we'll be ready to go. Then we'll jump onto that next board. We've got a couple things that we wanna show folks, okay? So finish this one up. Okay, Dill, how are you making it? Good, looks good, man, nice job, nice job. All right, let's slide that one out of the way. That'll be one of, uh, one of the ones we'll use to uh, show how we apply the varnish, okay? We're to the point of, uh, we're gonna tack cloth these off, okay? So there's your tack cloth. It's no more than a, a sticky cheese cloth, right? Yeah. But it really, if you swipe, see how it picks up all that dust? And on this profile, you kind of want to, kind of want to align it into that bead and make sure it gets down in there and gets that dust out of there. So go ahead and while you're doing that, Dylan, I'm going to go ahead and get our varnish ready. Okay. We're putting a clear coat on it today. Uh, it's gonna be gorgeous. You know it, I know it. You've had it in, in your mom's uh, and dad's home. You know, sometimes we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to turn the brush and come down into, that, into those edges. Because this is a tongue and groove product, we wanna make sure that we're covered to that tongue. Same thing on the beveled edge side. We're gonna have to address that a little bit with the edge of the brush. And then to finish, we'll come back and address the top, right? and we're dragging it out, and that, that lumber will grab what it wants. Yeah. We're not looking for a heavy coat, because after install, we're gonna 
sand it, right. very light sanding, and then we'll put that final thin coat on it once it's up on the ceiling and installed, right? So there we go, we're addressing the edge. Looks like we got good product over here. You're almost brushing to the point where it's dry, Dylan. Try and get rid of all those brush strokes. What do you think, looking okay? Yep. Give it a shot, man. We want to get as much coverage as we can. Yeah. If we miss a little bit, it's not the end of the world because we have that second coat. What do you think, Dill? How's it look? Good. Looks good? I think it looks great. It's not going to be too awful long. This is going to be a beautiful piece of work yeah. up on that coffered ceiling, right? So I, I'm excited about it. I think it's really going to be a beautiful project. So stay tuned, everybody. We look forward to seeing you next time. Till then, from Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, this is Steve. Dylan. And we'll see you next time. I'm Joe Ashcroft. This is my wife, Jessica. We were working on uh, our bathroom countertop, our vanity countertop for our downstairs bathroom. And we were looking for a little bit different uh, material to stand out against some of the tile uh, and some of the darker colors we used. So we went with Hickory from, from Bayard Brothers, which is a little bit higher end material that we could, we could use and would stand up to um, being in a wet environment. So after we knew the material that we wanted, we started pricing on Barrett's website to see kind of where the starting point was for pricing and the options for the dimensional lumber and the sizing. And we were gonna try to plane together a couple pieces, um, but once we asked Steve and we talked to him about ordering and we went through that process with him, he kind of explained how many pieces we need and went through the pricing options for them to join those together and have it kind of ready for us to install. One thing that we really specialize in is our ability to do custom orders. It can be anything from custom dimensional lumber to a custom countertop, a custom workbench top, or even custom panels. We called them up, gave them the dimensions. They joined all the wood together, planed it out real nice and smooth. They didn't finish it for us because we wanted to have control over you know, what stain and what grit of sandpaper we used and all that stuff. But yeah, they had it ready for us in about two weeks and, uh, and I just went with the install and cut it to size and put it in. They kind of guided us as far as, you know, what kind of grit I'd want to use, what would work best as far as polyurethane, and, and we got everything we needed from them. When we chose to do the countertop project, we, we kind of wanted to go with wood because it would be easier for me to install the plumbing and drill through the, the wood slab and, and make the knockouts. We also can do a lot of different custom stuff with the countertops. If you have a sink cutout that you need done, um, we can throw it up on the CNC and do that sink cutout for you. We also have the ability to do a 45 miter if you need that done. And we also offer uh, pre-finishing here, that way you don't have to do that on site. Don't be afraid to contact one of our sales reps or jump online um, and check us out. Oh yeah, it's exactly what we envisioned. We actually got the piece of wood that was actually cheaper, but it had more character in it. And it had a few more knots, a few more imperfections, but we love that. I, I think it's, I think it worked out great. Um, I think it's kind of what pops in the back. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. Looks great. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods in Canfield, Ohio. I'm Steve Stack, Director of uh, New Business Development. And uh, today, we have a little something up our sleeve that we want to introduce to you folks. And so let's take a walk and, and we're going to show you something that uh, we've been working on for, oh, a few months now. And uh, it's uh, hopefully going to be designed for, for you folks to be able to uh, take part in some DIY ideas, uh, some interviews. It's gonna be, be educational, it's gonna be informational, and uh, it's gonna give us a chance to introduce some new products to you. So let's walk back and take a look what we're, uh, what we're working on right now. Morning, John, morning, Tommy. Okay, so, so today, back here in our new workshop studio area, uh, 
We have, we have John with us and, and he's installing some hardwood floor in our studio corner. John, let's talk about this Aquabar product for a second. They take a paper cloth material and they embed a layer of the felt tar emulsion. John, what's the advantages of that? We, we prefer Aquabar because it has a membrane which helps keep the moisture from coming up through the floor into our new floor. It also allows, that paper also allows the floor to slide because the floors will move, even though they're nailed down, they will move. Climate control is of the utmost importance. So what's happening, John has, has started laying these first few runs of, of the flooring. And so John's, John has started that process. He's coming to the end of a run. And this is, this is one of those neat little tricks, okay? You don't need a pencil all the time. Johnny, show us how we're gonna mark that end cut. First of all, we don't have time to measure up this piece of wood to a floor. So what we do is we figure out the floor is going in like that. We take the side and we cut it off. We turn it around like this. We just put it down the wall and we mark the edge of it. Such a piece of the groove, put it down. No measuring, no pencil, nothing, just mark it. And then I have a quarter inch space on the edge. You made mention of, of something that's, that's very important, uh, your nailing pattern. The three quarter fur is probably the optimum subfloor underlayment to use underneath hardwood flooring. We know there's a lot of strand board out there today. Right. And it too is widely accepted. It's accepted by the National Hardwood Flooring Association. But what do they tell you, John? Don't they tell you to increase your nail pattern on that? Nailing patterns on, on, on floors are generally about every 12 inches. Um, but it's very important to get, to look at your situation because you, you're gonna have a lot of expansion and push. You, you just don't want the floor to be locked down too tight. It needs to move. Yeah. So. So it's, it's a little bit of a balancing act. Different applications, different climates. Uh, you take all that into consideration. So, John, nail away. So, so John, let's, let's shift gears a little bit here and, and let's, let's talk about the Senco tool that you're using today. Okay, today, I know that's, that's your cleat gun as it's yeah. referred to, right? Very common fastener for the hardwood flooring industry, right. right? On our last piece, when we're installing floors, we usually like to leave a gap so that when the floor expands, it has room to go so we don't get a buckle at all the joints. What we do is we take our last distance, and if the distance is two inches, we'll subtract three eighths of an inch off of that, and that would be like an inch and five eighths. And we just make it shorter. It's basically, we make it simple. It's a shorter than the, the space that's there. So we have room to expand. Okay, so it's ripped narrow enough where it slips past that tongue. Right, we always have it so it slips past the tongue. Okay, and now you're bringing it back to engage, it, engage the tongue and groove. We preferred to show this in the unfinished state. Right. And now we can come in here and put the protective finish coat of our choice on it. So we'll be doing that here in the next couple days too. We wanna to get a finish on it, get it protected. But as a whole, we're, we're wrapped up to the wall. We're nice and tight across our landing treads and, and uh, we're ready to, to uh, get this guy sealed up and, and move on to our next project. Correct, yes. John, appreciate it. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. John, what are you up to today? Ah, just putting this uh, beautiful door in. Beautiful door? What do we have? Uh, inch and three quarter thick, solid oak. It's your antique oak. That's that antique oak that goes with our flooring at the other end of the room. It, huh? it, it is heavy. It is really heavy. <laughs> I, 
Oh, it's beautiful, I love it. Well, when we usually install a door, the first thing we do is we check the opening for plumbing level. Um, and after we do that, we add shims, and those are the tools that we use to keep the door straight. And then we fasten it in with nails. So good. So uh, it looks like you've got a little jump start on me here. I, I see some shims cut back. I see your, your last set of shims. And tell me, what, is, is that placed there for a reason, right by the lock set? I had a little bit bigger gap than what I wanted right here. So I already had shimmed up here, and I just wanted to correct the, <coughs> the gap. Okay, so, so that gap, a lot of times you, hit, you hear that referred to as the margin, the margin. right? Okay, and, and I'm looking and you've got a, a nice margin established across the head, down your hinge side, and, and now, now on your, your striker lock side. So, so you're, ready, you're about ready to start to trim this thing out? Oh yeah, I'm just, just about ready to do that. The first thing I do when I hang a door is I come in and I check level, which would be the floor. I find out if the floor has a level surface. And if it's not, I will cut the jams, which are the sides that hold the door. I will cut them so that the, the pieces on the top will be level. But you got to start off and you really have to make sure that you have every, you start off with plumb and level. Um, we usually start wait, off- Wait, wait a minute. Say those two words one more time. Plumb and level. Okay. okay. Yeah, and plumb would be vertical. And we do that so that the door hangs nice and straight and um, everything works well. And when you look at it, it's pleasing that way. If you don't make sure it's level and plumb, you can still hang the door. But what happens is sometimes when you open it, it'll just close on its own or it'll open on its own. If you take a quick peek at this bubble, it's not quite level, the floor. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to correct that. <laughs> Corrected that pretty good. Yeah, yeah. But I noticed when I corrected it, I have a gap over here now. So what happens is there's a little hump in the center. So, so I can tell what I have to do to make my frame level on the top. I usually just put my level there and I mark this pencil here. I mark the pencil right here. And I'll mark this left and right so I don't get confused. When you get older, you get confused. And so this tells me the, what the, the length is to keeping it level on this side and this on that side. So it's not very, it's not a big difference. So that's gonna, that's gonna transfer. You've established that on this concrete floor. Right. And that's, that's gonna carry right up the jam legs and that's gonna allow your, your head, head is, to be level. To level, correct. All right, so after I establish that, the next thing I usually do is I take, I grab, I take the door and the door comes with stops and it's, These are stops and these are pre-mounted on the door when you get a, a pre-hung door from Baird Brothers. And I remove these stops. I take them off and what I do is I drill holes in the jam all the way down behind the stop. And I countersink them and I take screws and then I'll screw my frame to the, to the wood stud behind. And the reason why is I won't have a lot of nasty nail holes in and, it. And, and that's where I was going. I had, I had two trains of thought while you were explaining that. <clears throat> Number one, typically you'll see, you'll see a, a nail out on this edge right. and to this edge. Right. Okay, so you've concealed that. Number one. Number two, going back to the weight of this door. Correct. Now it's an inch and three quarter door. I'm looking at four inch hinges, mm -hmm. okay? But those hinges are only as good as how they're fastened to the door, to the yeah. jam, and the jam to the wall. Yeah, on the heavier doors, we use ball bearing hinges, and it makes the door just work a lot smoother. You want to make sure you get a good quality hinge when you're hanging these doors, too. Because of the weight of them, you want it to not bend or twist. And also, these hinges, I, I have taken two screws out of the top hinges, and I've replaced them with larger screws that will go back into the stud, so this hinge can't okay, move. Okay, so, so you're, you're going through the hinge, through the jam, into the jack stud. Right, exactly. Very good. So when we're all done, um, we'll put the stop back on. And the other advantage of this too is if a house settles or moves, I can just, I can just take the stops off and readjust these screws a little bit one way or the other 
to make the door work perfect again. Let's not hold you up. Let's, okay. let's put well, some you know trim what? on Tom's, the outside. Uh, of Tom's going to put the stops on and we're going to put some trim on. So let me get out of the there way. There we go. To get our gun set up and we'll get going. Good okay. deal, John. Thank you. I'm going to close the door. I want to get it flush. Okay, I'm good. So go ahead and put the stops. Done, Tom? Okay, good. Quarter should be a quarter inch on your side, too. Johnny, what'd you do? Just Put a little casing on the door. Huh? We're all done. Yep, yeah, yeah, Tom got it uh, casing up by just finishing putting a couple nails in it. That's all. Hey, it turned out, turned out phenomenal. Looks great. Mm -hmm. Thank nice, you. nice job. Nice job, guys. So we're nice, plumb, level. The door swings very nice on those four inch ball right. bearing hinges. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, inch and three quarter door. It's a brute. It's heavy. It's heavy. So it's we stayed with that. Stayed with that theme, went with a three and a half inch casing leg mm -hmm. in that antique oak, went to a one by six head with a five degree right. little ear cut on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it just kind of fit the door. So right. looks good, looks good. It's starting to come together for us, but it is. Appreciate it, is. it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
it, if it opened up a little bit, you'd have the same color and you wouldn't notice it. John has, has made provisions to allow room for that wood to expand. And he's also implemented a nice joint in the corner. So we have some forgiveness there also, and yet maintain a nice butt joint corner. And it looks nice and square, but there's forgiveness in it. And he, he did a dado cut again. And in the corner, the boards aren't nailed right at the very end of the corner. The boards are nailed a couple inches out back to that first stud and that corner is allowed to float. So there's tension behind it and as it moves, it can open up, but the joint is still closed on the face side. Very nice, very basic joinery, but having the forethought to allow for that movement that all wood's gonna do. Instead of just running the boards uh, to each other, we decided to dado one of them out and then we'd have a little slip joint that this way when the boards expand and contract, you see, you don't see any openings or any light behind it. You ask about all of my marks on the wall. Uh, the first thing that we do after we got the benchmark from the laser is then we calculated where all the tops of our boards are gonna be. And we chalk lines so we can, this way we can keep everything relatively straight so when you come into the corner, everything looks neat and um, it, it's just a good way of keeping track of things. And then the vertical lines are, we mark every stud on the wall, we pencil mark it so that as we nail, it, we nail right into the stud and we're not nailing into a wire or anything else. I always take the extra time to mark where every stud is so that there's no missing. In other words, there's no chance of walking out of here and we, we put nails in an area that didn't have a stud in it. Because with air nailers, Sometimes you don't know whether you're hitting or not, so we always double check and mark the walls out. This, this last joint does not fall on a stud. This is John's stud line here and here, okay? We're breaking in between on that joint, but because of the product and, and the way it, it interlocks, it's actually a tongue and groove product. So that's oriented on the wall like this. When Tom puts that next board on, it is locked below in a tongue and groove fashion rather than a shiplap fashion. And then once that's nailed, it's almost like installing hardwood flooring. Same principle, okay? So it's locked in. So now if we have that joint end to end and we come over it with that next layer of of uh, nickel gap siding material, it's locking those two pieces together. So it isn't necessary to nail right at the end. We might be nailing back here where that stud's located. I, I found this laying by your, by your pile of pre-cut <laughs> material. Right. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, a storyboard or a story stick. John has marked this out at the increments for the width of the board. He used his storyboard, story stick, to be consistent in your marking from the column to the corner, the corner back to the column, and that created your chalk lines. It's, it's simple this way. In other words, I have it, there's no mistakes. So everything's marked exactly you, the same. You, you, see that, you, you see that a lot uh, in, in woodworking when, they're, uh, when we're doing shiplap or nickel gap siding mm -hmm. as we are today. So another little, another little tip to take home and keep in the back mm -hmm. of your mind. All right. For right now, we have our siding in place. Uh, John and Tom, have, again, did a beautiful job, made it look easy. It's, it's the forethought. Thinking ahead a little bit, thinking not one board ahead, two board ahead, three boards ahead. Think the whole wall through, like John did that entire layout on the wall. He knew what he was coming up against and therefore makes it look easy. So until next time, hang in there, stay safe.
John, a couple weeks ago, we had a conversation as we're starting to, to build out this workshop studio. Right. And we needed some cabinetry. Correct. So we put our heads together and said, well, if, if we had a workshop to start with this 20 something by 30 something room, mm -hmm. blank canvas, what would we do? So we came up with a plan, did a couple sketches mm -hmm. and said, okay, that's good. They went well, they, they turned out beautifully. Mm -hmm. And then we needed some cabinet doors. We offer about uh, six, seven different profiles of cabinets as far as the inside sticking, the edge treatment, the panel, the panel configuration, raised panel, flat panel, et cetera. Uh, but you and I talked and we wanted, we wanted a, a, a little beefier door. Correct. So we went to an oversized rail and style assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a three and a half here and a two and a half, two and seven sixteenths, something on the sides. And we kept the doors a little beefier on the edge. What happens when you order a cabinet door from us, we're gonna request from you uh, one of two things, either the actual opening size of the cabinet, the finished opening size, or the actual size of the door. We can work our drawings either way. Our shop has pre-bored every door to accept the hinge. Correct. All right, why don't you show us how these hinges snap in here, John? Sure, no problem. These are fantastic. No screws, no, no anything. You just take, push the hinge in, seat it in very simply, and then just push this edge over like that. Now I can pick this right up because it'll hold it. The hinges also have self-closure, which you can adjust the rate of speed just by turning this little knob. See how much faster it went? And if I want it to go slower, it will go slower. So you can also, if you want to take them off to finish them after you make sure everything fits, they come right off. And, and this is an option. We, we can bore them and supply the hinges for you, but they're custom made for your job site. Right. Just like they were for our workshop. So, you know, I see Tommy over here finishing up inside a cabinet. Let's go see what he's up to sure. over there. Right. This is, this is kind of cool, John. Uh, another one of our partners, Craig, right. Right. Uh, here, here we find Tom using one of their, one of their uh, oh, yeah. hole locators, right? Correct. It's yeah. a, that's a nice, neat little template. You stick the indexing pin in here like this, hold it, and then there's no mistakes. And you just go right up the route and drill every hole. So the cabinet is exactly the same all the way around. It's a great tool. And we have two of these together, but really just one of them would do the job. Um, and yep. there's a special drill bit that comes with it. It has a little stop, so when you push the drill in, it will stop and it won't go So that long. regulates your depth right. on, your, on your end panel. Right. And the clips are standard uh, shelf clips. You can get them anywhere. Yep. Put them in there. So. Very good. And this is how we decided where our top parts of the hinge would go, just by setting the door like this and marking it. Go ahead and get them interlocked. Let's go ahead and throw this second sure. guy in. All right. Let's kind of hang on to that for a second, Steve. Yep. And let me get the click. And that one's in. Yeah, there we go. So, uh, with with a with a little bit of, uh, of patience, and right. you step back and you look at it. You're looking at your gap. Your your alignment at the bottom looks good, and it's all done. We're ready right. to go. We're almost ready for hardware. Just one screw screwdriver, <laughs> and that was it. Good deal. Good deal. Thanks, Johnny. Thank I heard we had tops delivered this week. Oh yeah, we we got this one installed already. Good deal. What do, we, what, what do we got here? That's a beautiful uh, plank character hickory. grade, oh, character, character grade hickory, right? Right, plank. I think it's the plank style. Plank style. style. Right. Plank style. What's, what's this going to be, John? Is this, this is our miter station? No, this is going to be where the miter box is going to sit and where we'll be able to look at some plans. Or... Sitting beautiful on these, these oak cabinets mm -hmm. that you constructed here on site and then our shop made those nice craftsman oh, yeah. style doors for us. Starting to shape up. But I heard, I heard uh, you're going to walk us through one today, right? And show us, yeah. show us, show us the way to sure. the old school way of installing with 
a plank style top, wood top, right? And, and one of the properties of wood is it kind of continuously lives on and expands and contracts. So you're kind of uh, making provisions for that. Right. We in, can, our, in our mounting technique. Yeah, we actually have a top that we're gonna mount over here. Let's, let's go over and see that. Yeah, it'll get some saw horses set up so we can take this top off of here. All right. I uh, see so you got it. You got her nice and protected with, oh, yeah. with our, our friends from Ramboard product. Oh yeah, it's a great, great product. So all it takes is one person to drop one tool. That's all. Wow, look at that top, Johnny. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, we attached the countertops. We, we created slots with a drill bit. We just elongated a hole so that in other words, when the counter wanted to move, which is going to, because it's wood, it allowed it to, without causing the cabinets to twist or the countertop to, to twist. And, and we, again, when we do this, we have that washer on there and we don't take it so tight that it's stuck there. The washer allows it to slide across the surface. So it may just move like this. Yeah. And that's it. But it's able to do that. That's the important thing. Now, the top's not gonna rattle. No, it's, not it's, gonna, it's gonna be snug enough that right. it's not gonna rattle or anything like that. Correct. But in the case that it wants to move. It can move. It can move. If you attach the top too tight, it could actually break the screws off that would hold it. Nice fit, nice fit. All right, John, I'm gonna get out of the way. If, if you guys wanna run a, run a few of those uh, lags in there. See how the top wants to come up? That's why yeah. I hold down on it. Okay. One more. One in the front over here, if you can, please. That's All it. good? That's it. All right. Thanks, Tom. So we've left the backsplash unattached at this point right. till we can come back around and get that get the third finish. and final coat Correct. on the backsplash mm -hmm. and the top. Uh, just in case through the, the build out of the workshop and studio, if we happen to get a ding or a scratch, right? we've got that last coat coming on. Uh, but other than that, we, for all intent and purposes, these, these tops are where they're gonna stay now. There's a couple different ways to attach the backsplash. You can come from underneath and screw the backsplash in, which will always keep a tight joint all the way across. Or you can just put a silicone or a glue on the back of the backsplash and just push it up against the wall. And that's the normal, uh, usually it's glued and installed like that. How we're gonna do it is we're gonna put a mark, we're gonna put a piece of tape along here where this is sitting good, tight to the wall, and we're gonna use the Craig jig and we're gonna drill some holes in it and actually attach it to this top. From the back side. From the back side, and it'll be on there for good. Yeah, very good. Very After good. the top, we have to refinish it again. Okay, again, Johnny, great job. Uh, hey, we're, we're headed in the right direction. It's nice to have a great product. I, I, heard, I heard we might have uh, another couple projects coming up real soon. So folks, stay tuned. Uh, as you can tell, we're having fun with this project. And, and as, as you see us doing things, if you have questions, uh, hit us at info at Baird Brothers, follow us on Instagram, our, our Facebook page, reach out to us. And any, any suggestions, you know, we're gonna have this workshop built out here in the next few months, and uh, we wanna see some projects that you'd like to see us do. So, so please reach out to us. Uh, we're doing this to communicate with you, and we wanna be uh, informational, educational, introduce our product line to you, and we're gonna have fun through the whole process. So till next time, see you soon. What you working on? Hey, Christy. Hey. Hey, I'm just looking at some uh, some drawings. What do you got here? Going to be starting on a project this morning. Yeah? You going to jump in, help us out? I'd love to. What is it? Okay, so we're going to do this this uh, a two-piece combination uh, cubby, lockers, 
Oh, sitting like on top of a bench mud seat. Mudroom bench. Yeah, mud, yeah, gotcha. exactly. Okay. Something you'll find in a mudroom or, I mean, some of the nicer ones you see in, in entryways of homes and the yeah. foyers and so forth. So we got a nice little design. It's pretty easy. We're gonna run through these plans and see what we can get together this afternoon. You know? Sounds good. I think we can knock it out in a day. So let's do it. Let's get started, okay? Okay. All right, Christy, so uh, by the looks of these drawings, we gotta start with our framework. So the way I see the sequence going, we'll, we'll build our framework. We have some nice five quarter poplar material. And then we have some side panels and a top panel. Uh, we have some of the same white oak material that we used mm -hmm. on our studio walls. We're gonna use that as a backer for this cabinet. Okay, nice. So, it ought to be a nice sturdy piece of uh, more or less furniture by the time we get done, you know? Done a little bit of prep work. We've got our tight bond ready to go for, for the joinery and, and uh, we've got some trim screws. Let's get this base glued together and then we'll see how some of these other components come into play. Okay, All sounds right? good. That'll just give us a little inside visual so we know we're nice and square. Okay. Yep. And then we're gonna do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what do we side? do that for? That's how you know what side to put your board on. That's gonna be rock solid. I have the easy job here. <sighs> Spoke too soon. Nice. It's good. Now that's pretty sturdy. Yeah, that should be aligned. Let's think back what got us to this point. Okay. We assembled our poplar base unit, our frame, our structure. Yep. Then we just went through a dry fitting process of uh, all of our dado assembly. And the top is dadoed into uh, those dividers and our end panels also. I think it's gonna be rock solid when we get this thing nailed, nailed together and, and it's gonna work very nice in conjunction with our studio walls. I would, I would add that for anyone at home that doesn't know what a dado is, it's this channel here that's been created through the wood and that just makes these uprights even more sturdy. Well, I think one trick to making sure your brads don't pop out is keeping it nice and perpendicular, keeping the gun nice and perpendicular to your piece. So this is where I'm sure if you're doing this at home, you have a nice little paintbrush that you would go ahead and smear that down. But seeing how we don't, you're gonna use your finger. Just to get a little bit more coverage. So we're starting the top section of our locker bench combo unit. We are building them independently. This could be built as one. We'll fasten the upper to the bottom just with some locator dowels. It'll sit up there. Okay. And same thing as the base unit. So let's get going on this. getting squared up with the face frame, and then we'll move on to the backs. Sounds good.
Now again, we're just, we're gonna be applying glue and we're gonna be face nailing. Before we do any of the crown work on top of this, let's go ahead and flip him over and run the back. Go ahead, it'll tell you which way it goes. It doesn't feel. That doesn't, isn't the way it, it goes. It doesn't look right. <laughs> Okay, let's get the saw set up. And what we're doing, because with the nickel gap tongue and groove white oak, character grade white oak, <clears throat> this last piece, we want it to be a nice snug fit, but we don't have room to rotate it in. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll join the two and we can hopefully get two pieces in there and then go. nail them both. You think you and I got enough strength left in us to hoist that bad boy up there? We got this. All right, if you say so, let's <laughs> give it a shot. This thing's a monster. Whew. Yep. That thing's huge. <laughs> That's going to hold <laughs> a lot of stuff. I'm glad we've got 12-foot uh, ceilings in here. <laughs> but it looks amazing. We've got nickel gap character grade white oak on the back some birch plywood for some of our cabinet box components, poplar one by two styles and rails, one by six kick, topped off with a crown base combination. All right, folks, we took a little break. We took a couple days off while our painter came in. He painted the poplar components and he put another coat of uh, varnish on our live sawn white oak uh, TNG nickel gap. And today we're just gonna, we're gonna finalize this thing. We're gonna put a couple support brackets on the back. We built this in two pieces. It's quite the unit. Uh, so the ease of moving it around and handling it. A lot of the old furniture was made that way. And we've taken a couple pieces of inch and a quarter oak half round, and they're gonna be support cleats on the back of the unit. So uh, I've laid it out. I've drilled a couple pilot holes and we're gonna take these over and attach them to the back of the uh, two units making it one, giving it that little extra support. We don't want that top tumbling over on anybody. Just a good, just a good opportunity to make it a little, little sturdier. Let me go over to the unit and uh, I have some layout work already done. I want to attach one of these, hit some pilot holes, run some screws in, and this thing will be locked up on the back side. Chrissy's not with me today, but we're going to try and struggle our way through it on our own. We'll go ahead and, and just touch these with a pilot hole. So I feel good about that being nice and stable now as far as it is not going forward on us. Leave the kiddos, jump up on there and hang off the code hooks, you know they're going to, but it's not gonna come forward and you'll have that peace of mind. All right, so now I'm gonna put the drill away, grab a tape measure, and we're gonna put a series of five code hooks on this. We've got all this great wall space, so we're gonna probably lay out a series of three on a top row, three code hooks, book bag hooks, whatever, and then come down a couple boards and throw two alternating ones so uh, we can take advantage of that space, 
keep a couple down low so the kids can get their book bags up on them. We chose a really uh, kind of a simplistic, old-fashioned look, uh, simple bracket. Ours, we went with the oil rub finish. We have some of the oil rub finish on some of the cabinetry hardware here and some of our furniture and so forth. So we went with that and uh, you can find these anywhere online. Uh, all of the, uh, the hardware stores have them and they make them in every shape size from traditional craftsman, contemporary, uh, pick out something that you like and something that works with the interior design of your home. Okay guys, so we got this brute moved in to where, where she's gonna call home with our nickel gap back. Flows real nice with our nickel gap, live sawn, character grade white oak on the walls of our studio. Accessorized it with some coat backpack hooks and then the bench unit down below. We'll accessorize that with a nice cushion. Then we're gonna start to fill it up. Got a little display area up on top of that solid top up there. I think we're happy with it. Thanks to uh, Christy Miller, Oak Hill Millworks, helping us on the build. And, and then we had uh, Ferris Painting come in and he, he put the paint and the, the final coats of urethane on it. Another nice project. We'll have plans available and they're a guideline. You might not like this height. It doesn't take much to alter those plans. Use your imagination, have fun with it. Two cubbies, three cubbies, mix it up. Make it your creation. Uh, the beauty of woodworking, it's flexible. You can change on the fly. So until next time, our next project from Studio 3B, follow us on the socials, Instagram, Facebook, all of them across the board. And stay tuned, follow us on YouTube. Next project coming up soon, guys. Thank you. Stranger. Look what I got for you. Oh, you got them done. Got the test boards back. Thought they turned out really good. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. I think that's the green light for this project, huh? I think so. All right. So welcome back. Thanks for having me. It's been a few weeks. Yeah. Christy Miller, Oak Hill Millworks. Hey guys. Our partner in crime. Yeah. And we get to have her back again today to make some sawdust. So we got a neat little project. Okay. Uh, compared to some of our others, simple. We're taking number two carpet grade stair treads, okay. manufactured here at Baird's, right? And we're gonna turn them into some meat cheese boards for an upcoming event. Nice. And, and we're gonna have fun. Real simple. They come with a bull nose, mm -hmm. we're gonna make that disappear. Okay. Via the table saw. Yep. Then you're gonna get busy on the miter saw. You're gonna cut to some lengths. We're gonna address the edges. We're gonna bring them back to the workbench and we're gonna do a little bit of routing on them clean them up, decorate, soften the edges. And the important thing is we're gonna be making sawdust, so we're having fun. Let's do it. All right, let's get going. All right, so we got our first stair tread. We have our fence already set on the table saw, and what we're gonna do is simply rip off this rounded over nose part and get them ready to cut down to width on the miter saw after that. Let's push some through. Okay, Christy, what's next? Well, we just got done ripping these down to width on the table saw, so I think it's time to pretty much get to chopping where we laid out our lines. You know, we were looking at some of these blanks and rustic was okay, but big voids, we were gonna try and avoid, avoid voids. You did it. I did it. You did it. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> but we're gonna cut around some of that stuff, right? right? 
So we're using 14, 16, 20, and 24 inch measurements. Yeah. So we went ahead and transferred those lines after looking at the stock we had to work with. Some of the character we're gonna leave in. By the time we're done sanding and oiling, it'll be, they'll be beautiful. Yeah. So how about I'll feed you over at the miter saw. Okay. And I'll keep you in stock. You be careful on the saw. Safety glasses down and we'll be ready to go. Sounds good. Okay, so the nature of this project, we're not working to precision cut lines. So if we're splitting a line or one side of the line, it doesn't matter. Right. For the end product, these are gonna be fine. It looks good. I'll trade you. Okay. Okay, you made quick work of that, Christy. Everything's cut the length. We're gonna touch that saw cut end with 120, 120 paper or something on the, on the orbital and uh, get those cleaned up. Then we'll jump ahead to the next step and put a nice little softened decorative edge on these things, okay? Let's get sanding. All right, guys, so we are in the sanding stage of the project now, right, Steve? We are going to hit this with a 120 grit first. The lower the number, the higher the grit, which means if you need to remove more material, you're gonna start with a lower grit number. So we're gonna start with 120. It's really important to work your way up through the grits. That means going 120, 150, 180 to roughly 220. That gives you a really nice smooth finish. And here's a really great tip. If you have a pencil in your shop, make a nice little line across the board you're working on. And when you're sanding, that pencil line will disappear and when it disappears, you know you're ready to move on to your next level grit. Once we go over this with 120, we're able to get a dab of oil on our finger mm -hmm. and wipe it. And as long as we don't have the orbital circular sanding marks, we're gold. Right. If we see that and we decide we can take it one step further, we might jump to a 180 or a 200, 220. Yeah, so I say let's start with 120 and see how it looks. Okay. All right, Christy, we're to the point of putting an edge on these, cut them to length, scared them with a little sandpaper, a light sanding. Yep. We did a little test run with the router. We came up with a 45 degree chamfer, probably about an eighth inch on the bevel portion of the chamfer. And it satisfied you, so God knows everybody will be happy with it. And you're gonna make some sawdust, you've got about 25 boards to wrap. <laughs> I better get busy. I think that is really nice. Yeah, it's just take, taking the sharpness off that edge. How do you like that router? I like that this is an extra wide base plate, so it's easier to keep it flat on your project. And it seems like it has plenty of power to handle that bit on a nice one pass application, so. Almost ready for oil. All right, Christy, that part's behind us. Yep, just got done putting this nice edge profile on. I say you back your car up to the door, load them up and take them to New Brighton, Oak Hill Millworkshop, and leave that epilogue do its thing. 
Yeah, we're gonna get a nice custom engraving on these boards for you guys and I think it's gonna look really good. It's been fun, thanks again. Christy, did you bring the boards back? Yeah, check them out. Oh, they look fantastic, huh? Yeah, I, I got them all engraved back in my shop on the laser, looking good. Just doing a little light sanding. I thought that would be good before we oil them up. Scuff them up a little bit, get the natural hand oils off of them. This is the best part. When you put the oil on, the grain pops. I think this one's ready. You want to start with that maple one? Yeah, let's do it. So we got a food grade mineral oil here, Howard's Butcher Block. Can't go wrong with this stuff. Look at it though, look at the green pop. You can see the figure come out. The wood is gonna take its time and it's gonna absorb that oil to where we might come back in an hour or two and it'll almost appear dry where you wanna go back over it with another light coat. But it is very important on any meat cheese boards like this or cutting boards you have at home or even your, your center island workstation with a wood top on it. Whatever you do to the top, you do to the sides and the bottom. And that keeps balance in the wood. If it's gonna pick up any moisture or if it's gonna try and expel any moisture, it will do it at a balanced rate from both sides of the, the product, whatever it may be. Yeah, and you can see that's starting to absorb and show some dry spots already. So typically you would just take that lean it against the wall along the shop here somewhere. And then when you come back with another clean cloth, just give it a slight buffing and voila, it's ready to go into service. I think they look really good. Let's see what this guy does. So you hit the maple. Now this is the white oak. That really brings that white oak to life. And that's all you're trying to do is get a consistent, even coat on it, leave it absorb, and then work in the balance across the face of the board and the edges and the back. That's gonna make a beautiful, <laughs> that looks good. beautiful board. And when we started this project in the shop, we decided we were gonna leave some of the character in it. So we left some of the tighter knots, a lot of the natural color variation. That was our intent. What really comes to life is that beautiful little personalized engraving you did down on the corner. Now it really has a background and some yeah. depth. That's really special. What do you think? This has been a fun one. And useful. I don't know, what do we end up with? 25, 28 of them? Yep. That is gonna be a nice meat cheese board for whatever event these folks are using them for. Thanks for having me. This was an easy one. Yeah, it looks really good. <laughs> we did some work, we made some sawdust, but it was fun. What are we gonna do next? You'll have to stay tuned for another episode of Build It With Baird. Check out bairdbrothers.com or oakhillmillworks.com to get to know us behind the scenes. Stay tuned. Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. See you next time. Welcome everybody, Steve Stack, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, Canfield, Ohio. Coming to you today from Studio 3B and we find ourselves in the workshop half of the studio. We're gonna build this cute little shaker style step stool. This one has a nice handle so you're not wobbly on it, you're nice and stable. Come along, let's go get this thing put together. All right guys, we need to go shopping for some wood but before we do, I wanted to give you a glimpse of one of our recent projects, and it was this mudroom locker bench assembly. Visit contentstudio.bairdbrothers.com. You can see the build out on that. It was a great project. We had a lot of fun, but back to our shaker step stool today, we gotta go buy some lumber. So let's go to the trim warehouse and see what we can come up with. So here we are out in the middle of uh, the trim shop at Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, 
and I'm shopping for some dimensional lumber today. Our project calls for about six feet of one by 12, whatever the species. Today we're shopping for red oak and a couple pieces of one by three. I found a beautiful piece of red oak, uh, one by 12, three quarter thick, 11 and a half net width. And then our one by three, three quarter by two and a half. And that's gonna act as our little stretcher cleats on our step stool. We're gonna load some stuff up. We're headed back to the workshop to make some sawdust. Okay, folks, we're back at Studio 3B here at Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. And while we were shopping, I picked up some red oak. Uh, that's what we're gonna do the project today with. I also picked up some poplar. You wanna build this little uh, shaker step stool and you wanna paint it, poplar would be a great option. This beautiful cherry lumber, that can be accented strictly with a top coat of a urethane product, or it can be enhanced with some type of stain, then your urethane. Same goes for the red oak. Now these are only three of the many species we offer here at Baird Brothers. You can always jump on bairdbrothers.com and, and visit the website, go to Dimensional Lumber, and it will give you all of those options. We have a nice little paper template that you can print out. We've taken that, we've put it onto a piece of bolted birch plywood we had laying around. It looks like we're gonna be able to get this out of about five feet of one by 12 and just a couple feet of the one by three. There's only five pieces to this project. So let's lay this out real quick. Okay guys, so this was cutting it out by hand with the aid of the miter box. We're gonna go ahead and cut some rounded corners on the actual step or the seat. Then we're going to remove the saw curve from the jigsaw with an orbital sander. So not bad for just everyday hand tools, right? Hey, Sam, what are you up to? Uh, we're just uh, laying out our pieces and getting ready for assembly. Everybody, this is Sam co-employee here at Baird Brothers. He can do anything front to back of, of that uh, molding facility over there. Quite the craftsman, very talented individual, and it's nice to have two sets of hands and his expertise, knowledge. All right, so looking at it, what's next up? We gotta go to the Craig uh, jig over there and drill some holes? Yep, I've got some basic layout lines here, and I've marked where I wanna put some screws in, and just a matter of taking it to the jig and popping some holes. Sammy, you drilled all the pocket holes. Now we're ready to soften these sharp edges. You brought a, a nice little palm router with you and what size bit did you put in there? I set that up with an eighth inch router bit with a ball bearing. The last thing we wanna do is start right in on one of our almost finished pieces and lay that router down and have a drop radius instead of just a soft radius, right? Yep. All right, go ahead, Sam. Let's see if we did it right. Yeah, see if we got her set right. I'm, I'm thinking that's good, you know? It definitely takes the sharpness away off of that product. So if, if, you're, if you're picking it up, moving it, this and that, or if you brush your shin against it, it's not gonna tear you up, so that looks good, guy. See what you got. Okay, Sam, so everything that's gonna be exposed to hands or little feet has had that corner rounded over on it. Our stretcher pieces, you did both of the bottom edges. So if you're picking that stole up, your hands aren't gonna come in contact with a sharp edge, right? Right. We ready to start to see if all these pieces and parts fit? Yeah, I think so. And let's wrap this thing up, get it put together. Okay, Sam, so you got everything routed, pre-drilled for the Craig pocket hole assembly system. Are we going strictly with screws or we're gonna introduce some of that Franklin Type-On product too. It does, definitely doesn't hurt to use a little glue. Okay. Just a little extra strength. The, the screws are pretty strong by themselves, but the glue helps as well. So wait a minute, what are, you, what are you doing with that little chunk of, what is that? This is just a, a piece of wax. I'm not sure what kind of wax. 
probably just like candle wax. And all I do is just put a little on the screw. That helps lubricate it and makes it help to not split out the wood. Cool tip. And you're ready to go. All right, bud, have at it. What do you think? I think he's ready for some finish. All right, Sam, hey, nice little project. I gotta thank you, man. Thanks for coming out of the shop, spending a little time helping me put this thing together. You guys that do it every day make it look simple. I, I greatly appreciate it, and I look forward to having you back at Studio 3B. Visit contentstudio.bairdbrothers.com. Keep following us, Instagram, Facebook, the whole nine yards. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to next time. Hey, do you guys have clutter in your workshop or your garage? We've got the perfect project for you today. It's a French cleat wall system. Allows you to organize all your tools, uh, whether they be garden tools, woodworking tools, across the board. Stick around, we're gonna take you through it now. Today we, we were shopping for our French cleat project. Half inch red oak plywood one by three, three quarter by two and a half, which will be our cleat materials and our 054 molding. And we're gonna picture frame our half inch plywood. So give me a couple of minutes. I wanna get all this material back to the workshop. We'll get our project started. Okay guys, so being in the workshop here a little bit, we had a space between our wall cabinets and an end wall. And we decided it'd be a great place to house some of the clamps, some of the the drill bits, the router bits. We have about 70 inches in width and we're about 44 inches tall for the upper cabinet. So we wanted to mimic that size. So our width is 51 inches that we've came up with. Working with a 70 inch wall space and a 51 inch outside to outside of our frame and from the wall about nine and a half inches. So it'll be nice and centered and it'll have a nice perimeter around it so it doesn't look like it's crowded. All right, let's go see how it's built. I've went ahead and started in the project a little bit. It all started with the idea of this, this little sketch. And because you're creating it for your space, you adapt it to your needs. I've been on the table saw, I've been on the miter box, and I've used the cordless drill, the cordless palm sander, and the cordless nailer. So stick around. Let's see how we've used some of these tools. We did an actual physical layout on the plywood to locate our French cleats. And what we wanted to do was have room in between each individual French cleat. So when we bring our mounting boards in, we can access the spacing and then allows the other half of our French cleat to engage our permanently mounted cleats on the plywood. We determined our spacing and then it became really self-evident where things wanted to be located. We're using a three quarter by two and a half inch cleat and we wound up being 44 by 51 inches on our plywood sheets, which the 48 inch plywood sheet plus our surrounding molding. And we'll show you how we did that. Uh, we applied it and then we started our layout. It worked out that we wanted to have some perimeter spacing on the end of our cleats and it worked out to be a nice 
full two inch net material. We have two inch material laying around the shop. That became our gauge block that gave us our center to center and gave us a nice true straight line. On the horizontal spacing, we started at the bottom with a three and a half inch width. Then we went three and a half inches in between each one of the French cleats. And we did that the whole way up through. And then we had a little wider margin at the top, which will be nice. Now we'll be able to hang some nice materials up there, have plenty of height and won't be interfering anything. The other item that we use, layout hole locations. So what we did, I took and I measured six inches in on each end and <clears throat> the thickness of three quarters of an inch. So I could go to my edges. We came up with an offset of three quarters of an inch on the back of our French cleats and determined that's where we wanted to locate a hole from the backside of the plywood. So when we attach with screws from the backside, we know we're going into the center of that nice flat area. In doing that, while still having our lines on, we align the bottom of this three quarter thick stock and we took and just went across, made a three quarter inch offset, okay? And then in doing so, we determined that we wanted three screws and we took and marked up our boards here and here. So now I have a left and a right. I come over, I identify six inch offset there, come down to the other end of our project board, six inch offset there. And then our center line was the length of our board. So now we have locations where we can drill our holes even after all those lines have disappeared through our sanding when we go to the next step of actually applying the finished French cleats. Okay folks, so we have a great product here at Baird Brothers. It's our B054 picture frame molding. We're gonna use this molding to conceal all these plywood edges. So it's a nice flat cut and they come together just like that with a 45 miter cut, 90 degree corner and making a nice face profile. We finished ripping our French cleats and we're getting ready for the final assembly of these last three cleats that need attached to our plywood backer. We just did an end cut on a 45 degree angle. So our three quarter surface kind of feathers itself off. So it graduates back down to the plywood. It's just not that blunt square edge. So we went ahead and did that. We've opted to do everything unfinished. We're taking advantage of gluing our French cleats to our plywood. We will be brad nailing just to hold them in place. Then we'll turn the unit over and we will screw from the back side of the plywood. So I'm gonna go ahead and run the sander here, make those lines disappear. Then we'll go ahead and install the, these, uh, the balance of these cleats. We've got our plywood sanded, all the lines are removed. We're ready to lay a piece in, see how they look. And looks good. Now what I'll do is I'll go ahead and turn the piece over and this will be our glue surface area. We'll apply some glue. Turn it over. Locate our edge, locate our three and a half inch block. Go ahead and leave it fall down into place. Then just as a temporary aid to hold that in place, we'll go ahead and shoot a couple brad nails in there. I'll give that a little bit of an angle because I'm running pretty close on the nail length and then our material stock thickness. Those are 
somewhat temporary because we're gonna reinforce that with three screws from the back side as we proceed here. You just wanna locate, drop in place. So I'm gonna go ahead, move around, finish this last cleat, and then we'll be back I'll flip him over and we'll finish the actual French cleat board up. So we have our board turned over and knowing where we wanted to have screw holes, we went ahead and just pre-drilled a small drill bit there. So when we flip him over, we know exactly where we wanted to be. Everything's nice and neat and in alignment both directions. And there's one of those tips, just a little bit of wax on these screws, and it really does aid in that screw doing its work because we're going in the solid three quarter inch oak underneath this plywood. There's that ratcheting effect. And that's only taking it so deep into the plywood, which is nice. I don't have to worry about going through my one by three, Our remaining three cleats screwed from the back side of the plywood. Now I'm just running a square up off of my marks down here, and that's gonna identify when we get the board up to the wall where we wanna locate the screws so we know we're going through the plywood and into our wall studs. Let me get this done, and then we're going to the wall. Okay, there we go. Just got done mounting our French cleat wall system to the wall. We located the studs behind, marked them on our board. Uh, we drilled a small pilot hole, ran the screws in. This is good to go. We're ready to start hanging trays and compartments and so forth off of this. We're gonna to put together a couple little uh, utility boxes just to demonstrate to you how adaptable and expandable this system is. We switched over to a Baltic birch plywood material. It's not gonna weaken when we cut configurations out of it. So using some of our cleat material, that is always gonna act as your backer board. So we attach a top shelf component to one of the pieces of cleat material for the backer board, and then you build off of that. We added a couple of the little support members because we are gonna be hanging off of this particular shelf. We're gonna be hanging some heavy clamps. We wanna transfer some of that weight or that leverage down a little support leg. So that's what we've done here. We took a inch and three eighths Forstner bit, drilled a hole, extended our cut lines on the, the miter box, nice, clean, neat. Of course, we used the wood glue wherever we could, but then we also took advantage of the Craig hole system again. Very easy, very quick, and as you can see, very strong. Same thing with this little guy. We just drew out a grid of line spacings, and then we took a Forstner bit again, drew a series of holes, and this particular piece is gonna be for some of the drill bits that we have. I'm gonna put these up on the wall, and this is just a start because we have some tools to find a home for, and I think this wall system is gonna be it. Another great project today here at Baird Brothers. We started with a sketch on a piece of paper, wound up with a real nice French wall cleat system, and we love it. Gonna clean our shop up, it'll do the same for yours. 
really a, a fun project. Follow us on, on the social, contentstudio.bairdbrothers.com. Plans are available there for this and previous projects. And hey, until next time, see you later. Hey folks, Steve Stack, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, back here at Studio 3B in our workshop. We have another great little project today, and I've invited a friend. Hello, Steve. Mackenzie. Thanks for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, Mackenzie Cross is joining me today, uh, marketing partner, uh, today woodworking partner, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've got this great little Build It With Baird project really a all around anyone can build kind of project carpentry 101 right yeah. very simple materials list we're going to make a little bit of sawdust we're going to do some cross cutting do some different things on maybe the miter box the table saw and we're going to take you through it so ken you ready to hit this i guess here we go all right ready let's go not. guys Really, Mackenzie, there's not a lot to it. Just a couple pieces of wood here, a nice easy project, especially if you're doing it as a family. Uh, I think we have involved an eight foot piece of one by 12 red oak. We're working with the red oak today. Along with the dimensional stock, we have some 3 8 buttons we're gonna use. It's all called out on the prints, on the drawings, it'll be available online. And uh, right now we need a couple pieces of one by six. 19 inches long, one will serve as our top rod holder and one will serve as a stretcher board about mid-body on our side panels. So I'm gonna get those cut, okay? Okay, very good. Nice clean cuts, square, ready to go into our project. We've done the majority of our cross cutting and there's one piece uh, of the one by 12 that has to be sized down to 10 inches in width. So we're gonna use our saw stop table saw and I'm gonna make this rip for you guys. Okay, Kens. Now we have to do a little layout work. Now I've, I've done a couple, and this is the bottom shelf of the rod and rack stand. And so we're gonna be drilling an inch and three eighths hole. We have two inch offset from both edges of the board. Then we have two and seven eighths from the ends for our first center location on the hole. And then it's three and five sixteenths equal spacing for the, for the balance of the holes. So I always revert back to the old tri-square cans. Mm -hmm. And we wanna create that two inch offset, okay. right? For our center hole location, offset from the edge of the boards. If we're doing multiple pieces, you take mm -hmm. advantage of your first layout piece. Make it a template. So you don't have to go, yeah. go through all the measurements again, right? Yep. Now we can take and just Hit our centers. And with this project, you have enough for, what, 10 fishing rods right here. But if you're more of an expert, you probably could modify this and make it as big or as small as you want. This is only gonna be 20 and a half inches overall. So it don't take up a lot of room, but it keeps your rods and reels organized. Right. The next thing we're gonna wanna do with this piece is we're gonna be drilling that with this Forstner inch and three eighths, okay? And the 5 16 depth that the print's calling out on the upper shelf, we still have our 2 and 7 8 offset from the ends, our 3 and 5 16 center spacing. And on this one, we're only going in one inch on our edge offset. Okay. And myself, 2 and 7 8 5 16 
And there we have it, Mackenzie. We're ready to start drilling some pilot holes, some locator holes. We're gonna give ourselves a couple lines here, and that'll be for our next operation on the uh, crosscut, the miter box. And what's gonna happen, we're gonna cut those lines out. So now we have that U-shaped cavity. So when you stand your rods up, they'll be housed in that little U-shaped cavity or a little holding rack. All right, let's get to drilling. Ken, do you want to try one of these? Okay. Nice job. <laughs> So Mackenzie, we finished the bottom shelf mm -hmm. with the uh, inch and three eighths by five sixteenths depth. Now this being the top shelf, and I've already drilled one of the holes, this one inch Forstner bit, we need to take this all the way through. Okay. Okay. Let's hit a couple of these. Okay, Ken, you ready to give it a go? Yep. Okay, Mackenzie, so we just started to drill these yeah. and now we have to clear out the front edge, the leading edge of this hole so we can slide the rods in place, right? Okay. Let's give it a Good try. Work. Okay, Mackenzie, folks, uh, our side panels, mm -hmm. one by 12s, we chose to cant them in a little bit. We can see on one that we've already done, from the 11 and a half inch width, we're winding up with a seven inch width. It works out to be two and a quarter removal from each side. Okay. And we have our cut line mark, okay? We have this nice fence that our saw can ride against, okay. giving us a little more accurate cut. Okay. Well, that didn't go so bad, Mackenzie. Looks good. We're to the point where we have to sand some components and then real quick, we're gonna be thinking about assembly. So mm -hmm. in the assembly process, we have to locate mm -hmm. our bottom shelf, our top shelf, and then our intermediate stretcher board. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're gonna do real quick. We're gonna put ourselves some lines there. We took some time, we did some layout on our side upright panels. So we have located, Ken's, mm -hmm. where our center stretcher board will be going into the unit. What we're gonna do is drill a couple small pilot holes, then that'll give us identifiers on the outside where we need to drill the 3 8 inch Forstner for our little button caps okay. when we go to uh, assembly. All right, so let's get these drilled and keep moving. We're going to do three screws on the underside of our bottom shelf. So I'll just get a nice even spacing on those. Okay. If you want to clean the face up of both of these, Mackenzie, we can get you started on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, McKenz, great job sanding. I hope your arm comes back to life. I can almost feel my fingers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're ready to go. We're ready to start to assemble this bad boy. Okay. We have drilled on the underside of our top shelf and on the underside of our bottom shelf, just a series of the Craig pocket holes. We're gonna use some adhesive. We still have our locating lines. We'll run some screws in. And uh, before we know it, you'll be doing the finishing sanding. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can't wait. All right, Kens, give it a whirl. Same thing on the top, Mackenzie. Okay. What do you think? Looks good. You want to slide that piece down where we're at here? Stands. Starting to look like a yes. uh, rod and reel rack. Yeah, it does. What we need to do now is our center stretcher board, okay. right? These boards are to be stretcher boards seven and a half inches off the floor. Okay, Ken's try that center stretcher piece. All right. Oh, that's going to be good. Go to your favor there. Okay, I'm gonna do that and come in somewhere close. All right, Mackenzie. We have good. one more thing to do. We have these great little buttons. Three-eighths wood button. We just need to dab them with some glue. Now, the last thing, Mackenzie, we're gonna elevate each corner. Oh, okay. okay. And we're gonna use those little 3 8 buttons. Okay. Now you're just, you have four main contact points. Let's tap four of those in. Perfect. Any of the exposed edges, they're sharp. Yeah. Okay? You're gonna soften them. Okay. All right? It's all we're doing is just taking that sharpness off. All right, so Steve, we have this together. It looks amazing. Is there a last step to it? We're gonna take and give it a couple coats of just a spray polyurethane from Minwax in a satin finish, just to get it sealed, protected, and uh, ready for use. So I'll probably jump on that tomorrow, but uh, hey, great job today. Thank you. Folks, we did it. Mackenzie, great nice job. job. First time with a Build It With Baird project, and we took on this great little rod and reel rack. What do you think? I think it looks amazing. I'm proud of us. You know, with our experience levels, we don't do it every day. We found our way through it, no problem. Plans are online. And hey, until next time, Steve Stack, Mackenzie Cross, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwood, Studio 3B, stay tuned.
Hey folks, Steve Stack, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. Uh, turned around in Studio 3B on the workshop side. Talking to you today about a, a service that we offer. Uh, not something we're building today, but a service that we offer here at Baird. We offer 3D printed samples. And what that entails is for architects, interior designers, and or for homeowners. We offer a service where you can go into our SPL section from BairdBrothers.com, left-hand column, custom moldings, 2,800, 3,000 different custom moldings we've manufactured over the years. Well, it's hard to produce and costly to produce a wood sample. That entails our guys over in engineering to take a uh, SPL file, send it over to IT, they load it up onto our 3D printer, and we'll produce a physical full-scale sample model prototype of the molding that you're requesting. And it's really nice for interior designers, architects, they can present it to the homeowners and say, here, this is what it's gonna look like along your baseboard. Maybe it's a casing. This is what it's gonna be, the framework, the millwork around your doors and windows, uh, crown molding, chair rails, accessory moldings. They're all available. Like I said, 2,800, 3,000 different profiles. Better yet, for the interior designers or the homeowners, you have something in your mind that you've seen somewhere, it's stuck with you, sketch it out. We'll bring it to life and we'll produce drawings, then we'll produce the prototype sample and get it to you. While you're on our SPL custom moldings page, you might be thinking about a baseboard and you might say, well, do I want a six inch baseboard? Do I want a seven inch baseboard? Do I want a nine inch baseboard? For a minimal fee, Click them off. We'll manufacture that 3D printed prototype for you and you can have it in your home and put it against the wall and see which one is the best fit for your design style. It's not complicated. You get the order into us, engineering completes the drawings or sends the file over. The whole process, depending on how many samples you request, how big the sample is, it might take a couple, two, three hours for us to produce on the 3D machine, or it's liable to be an eight hour run, but we'll get them to you. Okay, Benny, so I've been talking a little bit about our, our 3D generation capabilities and, and uh, how we take it from the customer's want list or design, we bring it to life for them in a physical sample of the 3D printed sample piece, and, and it's full size, all the details, and then they give us the green light. Mm -hmm. What do you do with it when it hits the shop? Yeah, so after you know the customer receives their sample and uh, verifies that everything's up to up to their standard and you know they're satisfied with what came off the 3D printer, um, from there Joe up in drawing is going to go ahead and send us a CAD drawing uh, down to the grinding room. We're going to upload that CAD drawing onto our CNC grinder. From there, the CNC grinder will go ahead and cut the profile in. From there, we're gonna take the head off the grinder. Um, depending on what profile it is, we might have to make a top, bottom, and two sides, or sides. maybe just a top, maybe just a side. Uh, really just depends on what all uh, that profile entails. Um, from there, we're gonna take it out to the motor, uh, set it up, and uh, make, it, make it happen for you. So in that process, while the knives are being generated, you've requested from Terry in the rough rip mill, okay, I need 400 lineal feet of seven and a quarter inch red oak. Yeah, yeah. So normally we're going to have about a two week lead time on a custom profile like that. If we don't already have the material on hand, uh, myself or Ed Berry will normally get with my cousin Terry and uh, he'll go ahead and make us that material up. Uh, from there, we're going to bring it into the shop after the knives are ready and everything like that. And we'll go ahead and run it on a motor. One of the many processes we go through at Baird Brothers. Yep, yep. Okay, so folks, what started as a challenge in picking that special molding out for your home, we've taken you through the availability of our 3D printed sample pieces, and it's a streamlined process. Access it through our website, BairdBrothers.com, and then we'll walk you through it. We'll work with you. Whether it's your design or one of our existing SPL designs, we can, we can accomplish that, and it'll give you the satisfaction of having a physical sample piece that you can have in your home and put you over the top and help make that decision. This is what I want. So 
you know, check it out. And if you have something special, we're here for you. We've got an excellent engineering department and we'll get you through it. So beardbrothers.com, 1-800-732-1697. The phone sales guys are, you know, they're there for you. So send us a challenge. Hey folks, Steve Stack, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods with a, another neat little addition of Build It With Bairds. Uh, I'm out on a job site. We're not back at Studio 3B or at the manufacturing plant in Canfield, but today I'm joined by Mike Jones, Mike Jones Hardwood Flooring. How you doing, buddy? How you doing, Steve? We're not at the shop. We're out on one of your job sites. Yes, we are. Wow, I see a bunch of stuff going on here. You've been doing some sanding. You've been doing some light staining. Take me through, catch me up to where we're at today. Basically, we had an existing pre-finished hardwood floor here, and we had some floors that needed to be refinished throughout. And we sanded everything down, and we have one coat of stain on them at this point. So you're coming in here, you're taking two beautiful floors that some people say, well, let's tear it out. And with your talent and expertise, you're making these 30 plus year old floors look like brand new through a refinishing process, right? right? Yes. And, and there's a lot of steps involved. So what we got going on here is we have um, someone installed a pre-finished floor of the same species next to an existing floor. And there was a divider between the room that kind of set up above the floor. The client did not like that. We're gonna set a board between the two floors flush with the existing floor to fill in the void. Okay, so what we did here, we had a half wall that came out, maybe about a, a foot wide, straight across to about three feet out, and it was about three feet high. The client wanted to open up this whole area, so we found out that this floor is different from this floor. These two floors were laid at two different time periods. So what we decided to do is run a board straight across and do the repairs. And that's where you see me nesting and weaving in, milling in these boards so that they'll get glued in and fit perfectly. So basically each piece has to be kind of milled. That's what we're actually doing, milling each piece. And then same thing on this side, the client took out a half wall here where you can see that they took it out. It's extended to about right here. And then there was a void where there's missing flooring about right here. So what we decided to do is nest it all back, weave it all in, so that when we sand and refinish it, it looks natural. So that's what we did here. Also, we have the same thing that's gonna happen at the fireplace. They had a T-molding that was installed on top of the floor, which was um, sort of like a tow or, or a trip hazard kind of a thing. And the client just wanted the floor to disappear into the tile. So what I did is I took a Festool saw and I ran it around three inches all the way around so that I could drop a board right in with a picture frame and the flooring will disappear into the tile on this repair over here. You know, back there around the fireplace, you really clean that up. You don't have that above floor level transition strip anymore, flush going into the marble, looks beautiful. Everything gets glued in because a lot of times you're taking away the tongue and groove so it's not toothed together anymore. So you have to use a really strong adhesive um, that yeah. is the key. So there's a male and a female of a tongue and groove floor and the male I can't use anymore because I can't tie into it with the square lumber that I'm, I'm putting in. So I go down with a chisel and a saw and I come in and I clean around each one. And after I do that, I glue in my new pieces and each of those will get glued in all the way around. And basically every board I put in, it's glued in. Your repairs are more solid than your actual floor. So if you look at it really close, it was a pre-finished floor, so there's a micro bevel edge between each board. So when we go to sand this floor so that it'll match and look good with everything else, we're gonna take that micro bevel right out of there. 
So the sanding process on this floor is gonna be a little bit different than the sanding process on the other floors. So we'll have to go down and grit to get rid of the micro bevel. These floors before we start were cut pretty bad. They were getting moisture from somewhere. So we've sanded them all flat, got rid of a good percentage of the micro bevel. Homeowner is ecstatic on how they look so far and they're at the stain stage, so. These floors are gonna look like it was brand new hardwood flooring installed in just a couple more days with you and your team here, right? Yes. What type of top coat are you gonna put on this? Well, client chose to go with a matte finish, so we're gonna run a sealer coat, and then we're gonna sand that sealer coat, and then we're gonna put three coats of matte finish on top of this coat. And it's gonna be just awesome. It's just gonna be a beautiful look. So I think you won't have to do anything else to these floors for another 30, 40 years. Right. The value of this 30-year-old, 20-year-old flooring, it, it, it just cut the price point in half, right? right. right. You're gonna get, th th this new homeowner's gonna get another 30, 20 years, whatever the case may right. be, out of this floor. Three quarter inch solid hardwood, tongue and groove, and matched traditional hardwood flooring that when it comes to value in a home. You can't with. match it. So folks, if you're thinking hardwood floor, or if you've acquired a new property, it has flooring, contact Mike Jones, Mike Jones Hardwood Flooring. Ohio. In Ohio, right? If you have that newly acquired home, this is a great option. Or if you're teetering in new construction or a remodel situation and thinking about hardwood floor, this just demonstrates the extra value involved in three quarter inch solid hardwood tongue and groove. It lasts a lifetime. Yes, it does. Folks, Steve Stack, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, the value of hardwood floor, existing or new, you can't go wrong. Bairdbrothers.com, content studio, you'll see more of Mike. Mike, thank you. Thank you, Steve.